Let's pray first. All right. Dear God, uh, thank you for this uh, time we can be here together, and um, please help me as I preach tonight, and help uh, me to do your will, and say what you want me to say, and uh, uh, bless this sermon tonight, and in Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, um, please turn in your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 3. <clears throat> Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5, and I'll read down to verse 6. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Tonight I just want to talk about trusting in the Lord, and I want to talk about three benefits of trusting in the Lord. Uh, the first benefit I want to talk about is he will give you blessings. Please turn to Psalm 40, verse 4. Psalm 40, 4. While you turn there, I'll read Psalm 34, 8. It says, O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Psalm 84, 12 says, O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man that trusteth in thee. Psalm 40, verse 4 says, Blessed is the man that maketh the Lord his trust, and respecteth not the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. It says, Blessed is the man that maketh the Lord his trust. Uh, please turn to Psalm 37, verse 3. And while you turn there, I'll read Psalm 32, 10. It says, Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he that trusteth in the Lord, mercy shall compass him about. It says, he that trusts in the Lord, mercy will compass him. Psalm 511 says, but let all those that put their trust in thee rejoice. Let them ever shout for joy, because thou defendest them. Let them also that love thy name be joyful in thee. It says, rejoice. Be joyful. If you trust in the Lord, be glad. Because it's a blessing to trust in the Lord. Psalm 37.3, I hope you're there by now. Psalm 37, 3, I'll read down to 5. It says, Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy ways unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. It says he'll give you the desires of of your heart if you trust in him, if you delight in him. Please turn to Proverbs 16, verse 20. While you turn there, I'll read Jeremiah 17, 7. It says, Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, and whose hope the Lord is. Proverbs 16, 20 says, He that handleth a matter wisely shall find good. Watch this. And whoso trusteth in the Lord happy is he. So if you trust in the Lord, you'll be blessed. He'll give you the desires of your heart if you delight in him. Mercy shall compass you, and you'll be happy if you trust in him. You'll be blessed. The first benefit of trusting in the Lord, you'll be blessed. He will give you blessings. The second is, he will direct thy paths. Please turn back to Proverbs chapter 3. We already read this. Proverbs 3, 5. While you turn there, I'll read Proverbs 11, verse 5. It says in Proverbs 11, 5, The righteousness of the perfect shall direct his way, but the wicked shall fall by his own wickedness. The righteousness of the perfect. What is the righteousness of the perfect? It's trusting in the Lord. Believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. All our righteousness is as filthy rags, but when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we are arrayed 
in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints, Revelation 19.8. We are clothed in Jesus' righteousness when we trust in the Lord. When we trust in the Lord, he directs our way. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, we already read this. It says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding, and all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. The first benefit, he will give you blessings. The second, he will direct thy paths if you trust in him. The third benefit I want to talk about is he will give you strength. Please turn to Philippians chapter 4, verse 11. While you turn there, I'll read 1 Chronicles chapter 16, 11. It says, Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face continually. Psalm 27, 14 says, Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. He shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Philippians chapter 4, verse 11, and I'll read down to 13. It says, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry to abound and to suffer need I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me it is through Christ we get our strength it is through trusting in the Lord we shall have strength please turn to Isaiah 26 verse 3 and while you turn I'll read Psalm 46 verse 1 it says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Psalm 84, 5 says, Blessed is the man whose strength is in thee, and whose heart are the ways of them. And in Isaiah 26, verse 3, and I'll read down the 4, it says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because... He trusteth in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. The first benefit, excuse me, the first benefit is trusting of uh, trusting in the Lord is He will give you blessings. The second is He will direct thy paths, and the third is He will give you strength. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Let's pray. <laughs> Dear God, uh, thank you for this time, and uh, please bless uh, Pastor's sermon and prepare our hearts as we uh, listen to his preaching, and um, help your will to be done tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. That was good. Thank you, Brother Josh. Awesome. Well, let's turn to Daniel chapter number two. All right. Daniel chapter number two. First message, trust God. It doesn't get any better than that. I mean, if you just got up and said those two words uh, from Scripture, man, uh, to trust in the Lord. Daniel chapter number two. And... Um, when you find her, we'll stand. We're going to read just part of it. We'll, uh, we'll be in Daniel chapter number 2 twice. And this will be just a little bit of introduction to a story we're familiar with, but it speaks volumes to our life, speaks volumes to the world in which we find ourselves in. And Daniel chapter number 3, I'm sorry, said 2. Daniel chapter number 3. Look at verse number 1, and then we'll read down through verse number 18, and we'll go to the Lord in prayer once again tonight and ask His blessing once again upon His word. Verse number 1, Daniel 3, 1, it says there, Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made an image of gold, whose height was three square cubits and the breadth 
thereof three, uh, six cubits, and he set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. And Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes and the governors and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then the princes, the governors, and captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. They stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye shall fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth shall the same hour be cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore at that time when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, the flute, the sackbut, the psaltery, and all kinds of music, all the people, the nations, and the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Wherefore at that time certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. They spake and said, The king Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man shall hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, the dulcimer, and all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth that he should be cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now, if ye be ready, that at that time ye hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, and the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made well. But if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and uh, let's pray once again tonight. Let's, uh, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for uh, the time that we've had together in your house today. Lord, we thank you for uh, just the blessing of being your people, your purchased possession. Thank you that we weren't purchased with gold, silver, corruptible things, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for our home in heaven tonight, uh, just the pearly gates, the streets of gold, our Lord and Savior that we'll see face to face. Lord, we thank you for all these things. Lord, we thank you for uh, the comfort of scriptures tonight. We thank you for the edification of the Word of God. Uh, thank you for Josh. Thank you for his sermon. And Lord, we thank you just for all the scripture that he brought to us this evening about trusting in you, the person of God, and the benefits that go with trusting in you. Lord, I pray that you would just bless what we've heard already. I pray you bless Brother Josh. Just bless his life. Uh, I pray that you keep your hand of blessing and protection upon him. Lord, I pray that you would help us as we look into Daniel chapter number 3. And uh, what a wonderful story that's been on our hearts and our minds since childhood. Many of us who grew up in Christian homes, 
can recall this wonderful story. Lord, I pray they'd be fresh and new to us tonight. I pray that we'd see ourselves in Scripture. Uh, Lord, help us to realize the importance, the relevance, the pertinence that this, this, uh, these 18 verses are to our life, the current life in which we live here in 2021. And Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name uh, for His sake and His glory and honor. Amen. You may be seated. It's a very interesting portion of Scripture, Daniel chapter number 2. Uh, these Hebrew boys are still young. Um, so I remember Paul writes to young Timothy, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers. Uh, so we, uh, we respect Brother Josh tonight, getting up here and preaching as a young man of God. He's got the same Holy Spirit uh, in him as uh, you do, no matter what age you are. And, uh, and he has an opportunity in his life to stand for God. Uh, you know, my children, uh, young as they are, they're going to have the opportunity in this life to be a Daniel, dare to be a Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, even in the midst of the house of God. You know that there's, you know that there's bad kids that go to church. I was one of them, so I can speak from experience. And, uh, and you know, you send your kids to Christian school or homeschool or whatever, they're still going to have an opportunity in this world to stand up for God. Uh, so here in Daniel chapter number three, uh, these these boys are still boys. Uh, they're not yet made into uh, young, what we would call young adulthood, that they are uh, indeed, in fact, teenagers, uh, and they have stood up already for God, Daniel chapter number 1. Then at the end of their schooling, Nebuchadnezzar has that great dream. He sees the image. We'll get into the image later. It's going to come uh, into confluence. Is that a word? Uh, together, chapter number 7 and other places, we'll talk about the image that Nebuchadnezzar uh, saw. Remember what image, what, what uh, part of the image Nebuchadnezzar was? He, Nebuchadnezzar, thou art that head of gold. Uh, and so here's the thing about knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifies. I believe that Nebuchadnezzar is going to be saved, and we're going to see that in chapter number 4. You can come to a different conclusion. You'll be wrong, but uh, just kidding. Uh, but I do believe that Nebuchadnezzar, after God humbles him and his declaration about who God is, he lifts his eyes up to heaven like the prodigal son that he is converted. He is repentant. Uh, is a change of mind that leads to a change of heart. Uh, and he looks to the God of heaven. He humbles himself. He writes a, uh, what we would call an Old Testament gospel tract to all peoples, nations, languages, and tongues about Jehovah God. Amazing thing. Uh, but here he has a knowledge of who he is, and it just goes to his head and makes him proud. Uh, and so, you know, they said the two worst kids in town are uh, the pastor's kids and the policeman's kids. You know, the pastor's kids rebel against the laws of God, and the policeman's kids rebel against the laws of mankind. Uh, so here is knowledge without regeneration. Uh, and so we say absolute power corrupts and absolute... No, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Uh, so this is exactly what we see here with Nebuchadnezzar, this head of gold. Uh, he's going to let everybody know that he's uh, the head of gold, and he is going to create an image uh, and he's going to ensure that everybody worships the image. And this is, of course, a forerunner, a foretaste of Bible prophecy. Uh, it's a picture of the Antichrist that is to come. Remember in 1 John it says there's many Antichrists that have now gone out into the world. Uh, there's always different forerunners of the Antichrist, and Nebuchadnezzar undoubtedly in this chapter is one of them. Uh, here's an insert of uh, something I came across uh, while reading the, uh, the Panama Canal by David McCullough. Uh, David McCullough's one of my favorite historians, uh, and uh, the Panama Canal is an amazing story. But here is one of many different people failed at building the Panama Canal. Of course, the French came, they went like usual, uh, and then you know somewhere along the line we picked up the task, and there was different people that headed up this project. But here was one of them, and I want you to notice his statement on power, on power. Uh, and so it says one one beautiful moonlight. Moonlit night, Gothels, who was in charge of the canal, was walking on a little hill overlooking the cut with one of the best known ladies of the zone. His companion was much affected by the splendor of the tropical scene. Yes, it is a beautiful spot, the colonel replied to her, or her exclamations, and I love it. But I love it for other reasons than its beauty or the things I get from it. Above all, I love it for the power. He was silent for a moment, 
and then went on. I remember once visiting the monastery of the Jesuit fathers. I saw the wretched cells in which they lived, the little rude cots they slept on, uh, the rough tables at which they had their meals, and then I remembered the vast power that the men who lived like that once exercised. It is worth living simply in order to have that. In, enthousia in enthusiasm, he raised his hand. The only thing in life worth having, wealth, salaries, these are nothing. It's power, power, power. Uh, and uh, you want to look at the motivation of many figures in society, uh, whether they're political figures or economic figures. Uh, it's all about these three words, power, power, power. You know, if you had a billion dollars in your bank account, you could not spend that in a lifetime. You know how much a billion dollars is? You take away one million and it's $999 million. Do you think you could spend all that, Scotty? I don't think I could either. I mean, after you got done buying an island and buying this mansion and that and all a fleet of cars and a fleet of aircraft and whatever, you think, what else in this world? So why in the world would you have $150 billion and you're still trying to make more? Power, power, power. Uh, and there's one thing that mankind, apart from God, unregenerate man wants, and it's power, power, power. So Nebuchadnezzar used three different things. He used uh, the religion of the state. You know when Nietzsche said God is dead, it wasn't a, him attacking God. He was a deep thinker, an ungodly thinker, but he was saying this, that the idea, the concept of God has died in society and something, there is a vacuum and something is going to have to take the place of God in society. Uh, so there is a worship vacuum. And what Nebuchadnezzar sets up is the worship of government, worship of the state. Uh, it's funny, you know, uh, we're talking a little bit about critical race theory, and Brother Tony said, yes, some people would think you're a white supremacist because of your, um, because of your political ideas. I said, yes, I know this. Uh, but, but people think, how in the world could you um, vote for a guy, uh, Donald Trump, you know, who... Uh, you know, former casino owner, and brass man, and, and just, uh, here's, here's the reason why. I wasn't voting for a Messiah, okay? Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is my Messiah. He is my God. I do not believe government has the answers, and whoever is going to give the most limited government that will not interfere with my worship of Jehovah God, that is a guy or a gal or whoever it is whoever, them, they, whatever, that I am going to vote for because government cannot, and even though it tries, it cannot take the place of God. Uh, and so here's the religion of the state. Another thing uh, is he uses fear. There's a burning, fiery furnace. You will perish if you do not bow down to the state. You will die of this terrible burning fiery virus unless you bow down uh, to it. So uh, the greatest motivation in this world, the greatest seller is fear. So go home tonight and turn on the news. Uh, and if they can make you afraid, you're going to stay tuned. Oh my goodness, I better stay tuned for the next hour. They're going to have a special guest on there uh, with sound bites and sound snippets that get me worked up. Uh, and fear sells, fear motivates. And, uh, and so there was fear involved there. And then, of course, intimidation. Now remember this, that there was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, so where's Daniel at? Trust me, he wasn't bowing. We know that. So if he was back in Babylon, he was in the plains of Shinar, uh, doing an administrative duties, whatever. He was out of the scene. He was out of the picture. Uh, and so there's only three boys out of about 10,000. Let's call them Christians, okay? 10,000 Christians out of Judah, other boys and girls, other Christians who were going to be bowing down to the state, bowing down to the ideal, bowing down to the government, bowing down to Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, and uh, here is all these Hebrews that are going to be bowing down. Uh, and so there is going to be the intimidation of the crowd. Remember the Lord Jesus said this, uh, straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to life and 
few there be that go in there it. Broad is a way that leads to destruction. It says in Proverbs, never follow a crowd to do evil. Uh, trust me, okay, look throughout history, look in Bible, look in uh, the land and the nation of Israel or Judah. Uh, the majority is pretty much always wrong. Uh, and, and whoever is on the straight and narrow way, uh, God's way, you know, we say, is, um, is God on America's side? You know, that's the wrong question, right? Is America on God's side? And I would have to answer that tonight with a resounding, no, we are not on God's side. Uh, but, but, you know, for 10 righteous, God would spare the city. And for three righteous men right here, God is going to have mercy upon an empire, and God is going to use these boys' testimony in a great, great way. So we see this same thing repeat itself throughout history. During the Roman Empire, uh, many Christians were killed uh, because a diplomat from, uh, from Rome would come around, and you were supposed to throw incense into the fire and say these words, Lord Caesar. And Christians would not do that. Instead, they would say, Lord Jesus Christ, and they would be uh, martyred for the faith. Uh, remember during the Nazi party regime, what did you see around? That, um, it's amazing to look back at history and look back at the videos and things today. You see imagery all over the place. And men and women were supposed to bow down to this imagery. Um, I was watching... A documentary series. It was fabulous. Great. It was called How to Be a Tyrant. I highly re recommend it. So now I'm going to implement these things. But they were studying these different tyrants throughout human history, and one of them was Stalin. Uh, and, and Stalin, uh, him and Lenin, Lenin was a forerunner to him, so him and Lenin had a distance between each other. But when Lenin started to die, uh, Stalin was just a, a, an amazing mind, evil, evil, evil man. Um, so then he cozied up to Lenin, and of course he's on the deathbed, and Lenin told him stuff and shared things, to, to which would later be propaganda. Uh, and the first, uh, they figured this is the very, very first, um, what do they call when they manipulate a photograph? Photoshop. Photoshop, okay. I don't think, but anyway, first Photoshop, human history, 1930s. Um, there's a picture of Lenin and Stalin together, and Stalin is sitting farther back from Lenin. They're distant, kind of looking like they don't like each other. Uh, so here's the Photoshop. They move Stalin up to make him look bigger, make him look nice and tall like Josh up here. He looks, Josh got a nice pulpit presence back here. You need to stand up as straight as you can and people be like, just, uh. so they made him look taller, made him look bigger. He had a lot of damage on his face from, I think it was, he had mumps when he was a kid. They cleared that up. Uh, and then they moved him closer to Lenin, making it look like they were cozy and they were buddies. And this picture went out throughout all of society. I never have been to the Soviet Union. I have been to the Ukraine. But every single village that we would go into and we'd uh, hold these meetings, we would, uh, we would hold them in the Dom Katura. And this is the house of culture. And so they did away with the churches, but they had houses of culture. And what this was was Soviet propaganda. And in every house of culture is an image <laughs> to Lenin and Stalin in every single one. Uh, so the image was everywhere, and people were to, in a sense, bow down to uh, the image or face the wrath of the state. And so here we have the three Hebrew boys standing. It reminded me, as I studied this, of a godly, a godly Hebrew in captivity by the name of Mordecai. Remember Mordecai? Uh, so Haman, everybody who went by Haman bowed the knee. All the Hebrews, they bowed the knee to him. Honorable Haman, except for Mordecai, he is not going to bow down to any man. He's only going to bow down to uh, Jehovah God. And one man, boy, he really gets Haman's goat and gets him in a tirade the same as Nebuchadnezzar. So here you have 10,000 Hebrews bowing down, all the nations, all the tongues, all the languages bowing down. And they think, looking out over the crowd, are there some people standing out there? 
and then they come to Nebuchadnezzar. It's probably so far back in the crowd uh, that Nebuchadnezzar, from his lofty position, he can't even see them. They're so far away. Uh, and someone informs Nebuchadnezzar that there are three men who refuse to bow. And we'll look at this later. Um, but uh, this is going to be a picture of the abomination which worketh desolate. This is a picture of um, the Antichrist that is to come to set up an image. If you notice this about the, the image, it is a 666 image. And uh, verse number one, the image, the image of gold, its height was three square cubits, 60 cubits, and the breadth thereof, six cubits. So it's by six, by six, by 60, 666 image. Uh, remember that uh, mankind, uh, 666, the number of man. Man was uh, made on the sixth day of creation. Goliath was six cubits. Uh, the best kingdom on this earth was Solomon's kingdom. I foretaste a picture. This is the best that man can do, Solomon's kingdom. He received into his coffers 666 talents of gold, the Bible says. Uh, when um, Joseph was down in Egypt and his brethren came down to him, 66 um, uh, Hebrews came down to Egypt. Uh, so six is the number of men. If they bury you, how deep do they bury you? You're six foot under. Uh, if you're social distance, how far apart are you? <laughs> six feet. Uh, it is the number of men. So a little forerunner, a little foretaste of uh, the Antichrist. And notice this, that uh, what Nebuchadnezzar desires is the same thing that God desires. All power comes from one source. All power comes from God. Uh, there's only one source that uh, is only one uh, being that is worthy of our worship, uh, our worth-ship. Uh, and, you know, uh, Psalm 1611, uh, you know, their path is a path of joy. In thy presence is fullness of joy. And God commands us to worship him, not to, for his benefit, but for our benefit. Uh, you remember the Lord Jesus Christ, and he went out um, to meet that woman in, at the well, went out of his way. Um, and here's what he says, the Father seeketh such to worship him. Uh, and here's really part of our evangelism. Our evangelism isn't trying to get someone to say a prayer. Our evangelism is to present the Lord Jesus Christ and get, find worshipers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and the Lord Jesus said, if I be high and lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And so they desire the same thing that God uh, desires. We see, again, we see this, and we'll get into this in a little bit, but we see uh, out the uh, mankind, the global elite, uh, the nations of the earth, the governments, the ruling class people desiring what is only supposed to be given unto God. So they're threatened with the fire. And the Lord Jesus told us that, uh, that uh, we will, you and I, we will go through the fire. Uh, and in this world, the Bible says, ye shall have tribulation. Uh, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. I was reading this morning in my Bible reading, John chapter number 17, one of the things uh, that the Lord was talking to his father about. Uh, he says, the world hath hated them, disciples, because they are not of the world. Uh, and so if uh, you don't get up in the world's wind, you know, in the morning, you don't get up in the world, the worldly wind is just blowing you right in the face, um, you're on the wrong side. Uh, you know, as Peter's preaching at Pentecost, he said, turn yourself from this untoward generation, meaning that the world is facing away from God. You repent, you turn toward God, and guess what's going to be going this way when you're facing this way is going to be uh, the world. And so uh, Peter says in 1 Peter 1, 7, the trial of your faith being much more precious than gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire. Uh, Peter says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which tries you. Uh, and so we understand that there's going to be temptation, there's going to be trial. The devil tempts us to destroy our faith. Uh, we saw this this morning with Peter. Um, Satan hath desired to sift you like wheat, uh, but I have prayed for you. And uh, so Satan seeks to destroy, uh, but the Lord is going to develop our faith through the trial. 
Uh, understand this as well. I think our eyes, um, again, we're going to be in the mi minority if we're going to stand for the Lord. Even among those 10,000 who call themselves Christian, you know, here, they're going to be bound their knee uh, to the world and the world system and to the image of the beast. Uh, and your eyes, they're not going to be on, uh, you know, Shadrach's not looking at Meshach and Abednego. That's not going to keep him standing up. Uh, their eyes are going to have to be fixed upon the Lord himself in order to stand with resolution. Uh, but it is encouraging as you stand to realize that you are not going to be alone. There's going to be other men and women of God in the foxhole with you. Uh, and, you know, a Russian pastor one time was asked about, was it hard to have a persecuted church? Uh, and he said, no, because you always knew what side everybody is on. I mean, they, they, they made their declaration clear. I mean, you were risking your life, risking, risking everything to stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, if you remember, Elijah in his downtrodden, discouraged state, he thought he was the only one left. Uh, but here's what the Lord said to him. And I'll read um, the account in Romans of this. Romans 11, 2 and 4. Had God cast away his people which he foreknew? Want ye not that Scripture saith of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars. I am left alone, and they seek my life. But saith the answer of God unto him, I have reserved myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image, image of Baal. And so there's an image of the world, there's an image of this world's authority, and there's going to be multitudes of people. There will be the multitude that's going to do evil. There is the broad way that leads to destruction. Uh, but the good news is, you go on a straight and narrow, and you're going to have a Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to accompany you on the journey. Three quick things were done. I want you to notice... I got this from a um, Southern Gospel song, okay? The three points. No bending, no bowing, and no burning, okay? I think it was the Statler Brothers, if I recall them. You remember that song? Okay, uh, so that's where I got the three points from, in case you're wondering. Verse number 12, I want you to notice this. First off, it says, There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Uh, so they, they wouldn't bend. They have not regarded Nebuchadnezzar because they regarded another. Uh, and that was God himself. Uh, so there was no bending. They have not regarded thee. They wouldn't bend from God's word. Uh, so what Josh did tonight is he preached the Bible. Praise the Lord. No one question that. Uh, and so, here's what they were not going to do. They are not going to back down from what they knew in Scripture. Uh, we see in common Christian culture, remember we live in post-Christian America, we see a great departing from the faith. The departing from the faith is not happening outside, let's call it the church, it's happening inside the church. And they're inserting and overlaying the Bible strange winds of doctrine. And they're really not strange. You know this term woke, okay? That is not a new term. Uh, most of your epistles in the Bible were written in response to the Gnostics. You know what that means? To know. They had some inside information. They were illuminated. They were woke. And they were inserting inside the Bible something from outside the Bible. And, and so they said, we will not bend from the word of God. Uh, and so they were going to make their title clear. And let me tell you something, is that if you're going to make it in the end times, you're going to have to cleave to Scripture. Your hand's going to have to cleave to the sword. You're going to have to make this the primacy. Uh, and, and there's going to be, at least in this church, as long as I'm right with God, we're just going to preach the Word of God. I'm trying to get pulled this direction, I'm trying to get pulled this direction, we're not going to bend. We're not going to regard 
what mankind, what Nebuchadnezzar is saying. Uh, so they didn't bend from the word of God. Uh, they did not bend towards Nebuchadnezzar's thinking. Uh, Mark 8.38. Turn there, if you will. Mark 8.38. Um, while you're turning there, just think about this. So all of Christianity, quote-unquote, is bowing to Nebuchadnezzar. And uh, think of what these good Hebrew boys are saying. They're saying, well, we live in a different era, different day and age. Hey, uh, Daniel, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we're not in Israel anymore. We're not in Judea anymore. Okay, we're in Babylon now. And when in Babylon do as the Babylonians do? How are you going to reach these people unless you bow the knee? They could have said this, I'll bow on the outside, but I'm really standing up on the inside. I'm a secret disciple. I'll keep my fingers crossed as I kneel. Um, I'll pretend that I'm bowing down to Jehovah God. I'll pretend. So here, here's what we have in Mark 8, 38. Whosoever, there, and Christ is preaching about the end times, the day and age in which we live. Um, you know, I, I really think, I'm guessing, and I, if you got some insight, we'll write a book together on prophecy and we'll make a lot of money. Uh, but I, I'm thinking 2,000 years, not from the time of Christ's birth, but 2,000 years from the time of Christ's death. Uh, so sometime here in the next 10 years, see ya, we're out of here. That's my guess, okay? Um, and so right in the end times in which we live, um, here's what the Lord instructs us to do. Mark 8, 38, Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me, and, notice this, and what? My words. There's a lot of people coming in Christ's name preaching a false Jesus. If you're going to preach, preach a true Jesus, remember that there's a divine twin, the Word of God. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. You cannot separate Jesus from the Word of God. Uh, so if you're going to preach Christ and Him crucified, uh, you are going to preach the Word, Genesis 2, Revelation, the whole account of Scripture, and you're not going to understand the gospel unless the book of Genesis all the way th through the book of Revelation flows through the message in which you are preaching, and you're preaching the whole counsel of God, the whole body of truth. And so here it says there, Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Um, you know, Peter writes, it. he says, if you suffer with Christ, <laughs> and the Lord suffered when he was here, and he still suffers through his body, okay? So remember when Paul was converted, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? If we suffer with him, and we bear his reproach here upon this earth, we're also going to share in his glory someday in heaven. So they would not bend. They would not bend. They didn't bend away from the word of God. They did not bend towards Nebuchadnezzar's thinking. And so here's the compromise, uh, the temptation back in Daniel chapter number three. Uh, listen, guys, I'm going to give you another chance, okay? Because I'm a really nice emperor, okay? Uh, maybe you didn't hear it or whatever. We're going to go through the whole thing again. Uh, and so here's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, they answer, and they said to the king in verse number 16, chapter 3, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. Um, so what they're really saying is we don't have to think about it. We're not bowing. That's essentially what they're saying. Uh, we're not careful. We don't have to give us some time to consider or anything. Uh, you can keep on playing the music all day long and all night long. We are not going to bow. So they uh, we're not careful. No bowing. Uh, there, and here's, here's what they determine. Uh, there's some things worse than death. And compromising your faith is worse than death. They would rather uh, die having stood for something than to lay down having compromised what they believe. There's some things worse than dying. While the Hebrew boys around them said, well, we have to live. No, you don't. No, you don't. Uh, and, you know, uh, one, thing, one thing that, uh, you know, Christianity teaches, especially you see the first several centuries of Christianity, is that the martyrs of the faith, they were held in high esteem as examples uh, for others to walk in. 
Um, remember this is that all the devil wants is your bended knee. So remember uh, that uh, if you bow down and worship me, all these things will I give you. And this is exactly uh, what's being said to these boys. Uh, Satan said to God about Job in Job 2, 4 through 5. It says, And Satan answered uh, the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, all a man will, will give in exchange for his life. Um, it says in Hebrews 2, 15, it says, Who through fear of death are led into captivity all their life. Just think of all the people who threw into faith, stopped going to church because of a virus. I mean, and they're still, they're still too, I'm going to have to go to Home Depot or Walmart or Wegmans and, and go into where thousands and thousands of people go, week after week, touching products, coughing, sneezing on things. But God forbid I go into a house of worship. Uh, so here's what Satan says. Skin for skin, all a man will give uh, in exchange for life. Uh, you let me touch him, he will curse you. This is what he says. He will curse you to your face. And so all the devil wants is a, bent, uh, a bended knee, but they would not bow. And then finally, uh, they wouldn't burn. No burning. Verse 17, and this is so great. This is just a lovely portion of scripture. Um, it, and they said, if it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able. And God is able. They're going to rest in the power of God. And notice this. One way or another, they're resting in God. Um, trust me in one thing. If, if you, um, God will get his glory, whether you do burn in the fire or whether you don't burn in the fire. So he says this. God is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king, but if not, so he says, God is able to deliver us, but if not. Uh, so the answer is up to the Lord. God miraculously delivers some saints and others he allows to die for the faith. He says, we're going to rest uh, in the power of God. Our God is able, no burning. Our God is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, but if not, be it known, O king, we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which he has set up. No burning, God is able. Have faith in the power of God to deliver you or to not deliver you. Submit yourselves to the will of Almighty God. There's many different saints that God has allowed to die for the faith. Uh, Paul recounts in Acts 22.20, a very influential death. He says, And when the blood of thy martyr, martyr Stephen was shed, I was also standing by and consenting unto his death. Well, you know what is a win-win for Stephen that day? He got to see Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. Uh, and then he got to be a martyr. You know what martyr means? It means witness. He got to be a witness, and there was a Paul over here, Saul, who would later be Paul, and shake the world for God. And God was going to allow Stephen to die that day and be a witness for generations to come. I've enjoyed very much uh, reading about uh, the, the um, Lutheran pastor, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was in a plot to kill um, Adolf Hitler. Uh, you know, he took a stand, and he died. Okay? Uh, but here's generate. He would have been dead by now anyway. But you know, for centuries, people are going to be pointing back to Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Have faith in the power of God. He's able to deliver us, but if not. Job said this, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. We'll have power, uh, have faith in the primacy of God. Um, last illustration. I've got some others here. About burning. William Tyndale, that's another one. Burn at the stake, praying a prayer. Lord, open up the King of England's eyes. In a few short years, you're, you know, we're preaching tonight out of the King James Bible, uh, that your New Testament is over 90% William Tyndale translation into the English. And as he's burning, God answers his prayer. Well, let me quote with this. John Huss, known as the goose. How many of you ever heard this expression? 
his goose is cooked. You know where that comes from? John Hus. His followers are known as the Hussites. Is burned at the stake in, in a word of prophecy. William Tyndale, open up the king of England's eyes. Here's what John Hus says. They will roast the goose now. They're, burning, they're going to burn him. But after 100 years, they will hear a swan sing. And him they will endure. 100 years later, almost to the date, a Augustinian monk by the name of Martin Luther nails, known as the swan, is going to nail 95 theses to his church. One way or another, no bending, no bowing, no burning. Let's go to the Lord uh, in prayer. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for, once again, we, we thank you just for the, the privilege it's been to be in your house tonight. We thank you just for uh, Brother Josh and what he brought to us about trusting in you. Lord, we thank you for the testimony here at Daniel chapter number 3. Lord, we thank you for the challenge to us tonight in the world in which we live. Lord, I pray that you'd help us. Give us the tenacity of these three Hebrew boys. Lord, help us not to bend. Help us not to bow. Help us not to burn. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all Thank you so much for watching our services today. We hope you enjoyed them very much. Uh, we'd appreciate it if you liked and subscribed to this channel. Also, we'd love to hear from you. If you can email us at mylbbc at gmail.com, we're going to send you this book. It's called Done. What most religions do not teach you about the Bible. It tells you how you can have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Also, if you'd like to find out more about our church and our church family, you can visit us at lbbc.info. God bless you. Thank you for watching this video. Have a good day.